um, in Atlanta. And I'm really excited to be uh, sharing with you today some of these updates on universal hepatitis B adult vaccination recommendations. I know it's just a um, small um, milestone um, in, in the work that you guys all do. So um, I'll go through some of the rationale and then hopefully we can have a good, dis good discussion um, afterwards. Um, so I'll just, can you guys all see my screen? Am I still sharing? Okay, very good. I'll okay. stop my video during my presentation. So as many of you know, in late 2021, ACIP voted to recommend that the following groups should receive hepatitis B vaccines. That's adults aged 19 through 59 years and adults aged 60 years and older with risk factors for hepatitis B. ACIP recommends the following groups may receive hepatitis B vaccines, adults aged 60 years and older without known risk factors for hepatitis B. So right now we'll discuss the rationale behind this ACIP decision and how it can help us achieve HHS hepatitis elimination goals by 2030. As a quick refresher, in the US every year, there are 20,700 estimated acute hepatitis B infections and over $1 billion spent on hepatitis B-related hospitalizations. There are about 2 million people estimated to be living with chronic hepatitis B in the US, of whom there's a 15 to 25% risk of premature death from cirrhosis or liver cancer. Now, the ACIP hepatitis vaccines work group's goal was to examine hep B vaccine policy and propose strategies that are most effective at preventing new infections, and hepatitis B related cancer and death. This hep B immunization strategy has evolved over the past four decades. Risk-based strategies were first introduced among adults and perinatally exposed infants in the early 1980s. And then universal infant vaccination was introduced in 1991 with catch-up vaccination recommendations for all adolescents in 1999 followed by the introduction of universal birth dose among all newborns in 2005. So all these steps towards routine hep B vaccination resulted in large declines in new hepatitis B infections among children and adolescents. However, hepatitis B incidence has plateaued over the past 10 years with more than 20,000 new infections estimated to occur each year. This slide summarizes the limited hep B vaccine coverage among adults in 2018. Overall, coverage was a dismal 30% for adults 19 years and older. Reported coverage rates were likewise low across risk groups, including travelers, people with chronic liver conditions, and people with diabetes, with particularly low rates among older people with diabetes. Surprisingly, among healthcare personnel such as yourselves, hep B vaccination coverage was only about 67%, which is far short of this group's Healthy People 2020 target of 90%. The past decade has illustrated that risk-based screening among adults have got us as far as it can take us. Initial decreases in new infections have stagnated. Rates of in acute infection are now highest among 30 through 59-year-olds, and rates have actually increased among adults 40 years and older, indicating that we are losing ground. We cannot eliminate hepatitis B in the US without a new approach. So it's important to recall that only one third of people with reported acute hepatitis B actually reported any risk factors. For the remaining two thirds of reported acute infections indicated in yellow shading, the previous risk-based vaccination strategy among adults provides no advantages in identifying and vaccinating people who had either denied any known risk or simply lacked any risk data. Racial disparity in hepatitis B infection rates showed slow improvement under the risk-based hep B vaccination strategy. We point out that after the universal hep B vaccination strategy for children and adolescents was implemented, Rates of HBV disease for children and adolescents of all races did converge to a lower rate. After 24 years of the risk-based policy first recommended in 1982, among non-Hispanic Black Americans, HBV infection rates did decline, but remained over twice as high as among several other racial and ethnic populations. 
Most new HPV infections occur in adults aged 19 years and older, and the rates among Black Americans are up to three times those of Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanic Americans. Furthermore, data from the 2019 surveillance report also showed that HPV infection rates have increased among non-Hispanic white Americans due to outbreaks among people aged 30 to 39 years and who use injection drugs. It's in this context that the ACIP hepatitis vaccines work group proposed that the existing risk-based hep B vaccination strategies expanded among adults and simplified to a universal recommendation. This slide highlights the updates to the hep B recommendation. As you see on the left, risk-based recommendations among adults are complex and include 15 specific behavioral and non-behavioral risks in three categories, such as sexual exposure, percutaneous or mucosal exposure to blood, household contact of someone living with hepatitis B, diabetes, or others, such as travel or having chronic liver disease. I know this group knows these, um, these groups very well. Uh, moving to a universal vaccine recommendation among adults serves as a natural extension of the existing routine childhood vaccination recommendations. For adults aged 19 through 59 years, the risk factor assessment is eliminated, and this collapses the numerous existing adult risk groups on the left into a universal recommendation on the right to receive Hep B vaccines in this age group, all infants, children, and now adults 19 through 59 years of age. For adults 60 years of age and older, the Hep B recommendation is similar to the 2018 recommendations and uses the same risk factors assessment for this older age group. In previous Hep B recommendations, providers were advised to administer Hep B vaccine to all patients who requested it. This new language is intended to prompt all providers to offer Hep B vaccination to individuals in the cohort aged greater or equal to 60 years, rather than wait for a patient to request vaccination, thus shifting the responsibility of initiating the consideration of Hep B vaccination from the patient to the provider. One of the reasons for this age cutoff is that among the cohort aged 60 years and older, ACIP considered that hepatitis B incidence is markedly lower at 0.6 cases per 100,000 population in 2019, and thus the preventable burden of disease in that age group is lower than for those aged 19 to 59 years. In February 2022, ACIP recommended a three antigen hepatitis B vaccine called Prehevbrio. Prehevbrio, given in three doses, may now be used as a Hep B vaccine in persons aged greater or equal to 18 years recommended for vaccination against HBV infection. Please note that due to insufficient data at this time, persons on hemodialysis, pregnant persons, and persons who are breastfeeding were not discussed in the evidence recommendations framework leading to the ACIP decision. And just a further note on Heposab B and pre Prehevbrio in dialysis or pregnancy. The safety and effectiveness of Heposab B and Prehevbrio have not been established in adults on hemodialysis. Data are not available to assess the effects of Heposab B and Prehevbrio on the breastfed infant or on milk production or excretion. Data on Heposab B and Prehevbrio are currently insufficient to inform vaccine-associated risks in pregnancy. And thus, providers should vaccinate pregnant people needing Hep B vaccination with Indrix B or Comvax or Twinrix. And that's largely based on the package inserts for those two vaccines. So in light of the new updated universal Hep B recommendations, here's a table of the adult monovalent Hep B vaccines. Prehevbrio is a mammalian cell derived alum adjuvanted three dose hepatitis B vaccine. And Prehevbrio like the previously approved Indrix and Comvax are all three dose vaccines. Indrix and Recombivax contain the small S antigen, while Prehevbrio contains the S antigen in addition to the pre-S1 and pre-S2 antigens, hence three antigen vaccine. Heposab B, approved in, 20... Heposab B approved in 2018 is adjuvanted with CPG 1018 and is a two-dose single antigen vaccine. Twinrix, the combination Hep A, Hep B vaccine, is not shown here, but can also be used to protect adults against hepatitis B infection. 
to summarize, in the context of the call from HHS and National Academies of Science to eliminate viral hepatitis, there are multiple examples and evidence where universal is preferred to risk-based approaches to lowering barriers to vaccination. This is in line with public health principles and practice. ACIP reviewed these examples along with the hepatitis B infection rates, dynamic risks of hepatitis B over everyone's lifetime, and health equity observations. ACIP concluded that by relying on previous risk-based recommendations, focusing only on the slow bottom-up approach of vaccinating all children who would then take their immunity with them when they reach adulthood would be a disservice to a large portion of the US population. Plus, the previous risk-based policy creates obstacles for the provider to identify risk and for the patient to self-advocate, which is a particularly challenging barrier for people in vulnerable and medically underserved communities, as this group knows. So what else is different this time compared to 1982 when risk-based Hep B recommendations were first introduced? Today, we have a growing toolbox and new access points for vaccination to eliminate this potentially fatal virus. There are now two single antigen, three-dose vaccines available, safe, effective, and with long-term immunogenicity. One two-dose vaccine, which is safe and effective, there's also one combination vaccine, and there's one three-dose, three-antigen vaccine that was recently approved. ACIP concluded that the universal recommendation would allow the U.S. to leverage this growing toolbox for public health and equity goals. With an eye towards implementation, this universal recommendation dovetails with the ongoing expansion of viral hepatitis surveillance, renewed focus on vaccination delivery, improved integration of services, and expanded immunization venues. Plus, by late 2022, we're anticipating CDC recommendations for one-time hepatitis B screening guidelines for all adults. Hepatitis B is vaccine preventable, safe, effective, cancer preventing vaccines have been available for over 40 years. But the previous risk-based Hep B vaccine policy was proving to be a barrier to public health objectives. For these reasons, we believe a universal hepatitis B vaccination recommendation among adults aged 19 through 59 will provide a better chance of achieving hepatitis B elimination goals in the United States. So with thanks to members of the ACIP Hepatitis Vaccines Work Group and followed by references. I'll scroll through a little quickly. I know this is recorded. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions, but what I'd really be interested in is in, you know, we know this is um, we're happy about this milestone, policy milestone. We know this is just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, be interested in, in discussing, hearing from you guys, about the, you know, the barriers, other barriers um, that you guys foresee in terms of trying to move the needle towards um, eliminating viral hepatitis um, in the US, US and elsewhere. Um, and I'll pause there. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. We really appreciate your leadership in this initiative um, and are really looking forward to figuring out how we can implement this, these guidelines in practice in Philly. And, and I open it up to our colleagues on the line who may be able to answer or give uh, give some answers or insight into your question about specific barriers um, and, and you know ways that we might be able to think about addressing it as well. Um, if anybody has any comments or to that. Dr. Finkel, I see you're off mute. Really perceptive there, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for that talk. I, and I wanna thank you for your work in this space and it's really, helpful for us as clinicians to be able to have a more streamlined recommendation and not have to pick and choose who to who to ask questions to and who to vaccinate. So I, I think it would definitely help. Um, you know, from my end, you know, I, I'm a hepatologist, so every patient I see is, is somebody who needs to be vaccinated for hepatitis B. And that the barrier that that I find most significant is that, you know, a lot of times patients don't come with the previous testing for me to know if they need a vaccine. I don't know for sure if they're infected when they see me, if they're coming for fatty liver, I might have to screen them for hepatitis B, for instance, before I vaccinate them. And so there's a delay in terms of when they see you and when you get the vaccine administered. 
So if I get results back showing that they need to be vaccinated, I'll recommend they get vaccinated, but they may not come back and see me for six months, even though I have the vaccine in my office. If they're coming from a distance, they're not going to come here to get it. So we then prescribe the medication as a vaccine or vaccine as a medication to their pharmacy. And a lot of these patients have a high copay when they get it delivered as a, as a medicine in a pharmacy rather than in the office where it might be free. Is there anything that the CDC can do that might help our patients access vaccines like hepatitis B vaccines in a pharmacy rather than in an office and not have a high copay for that? Thanks, Dr. Finkel. I think the first step is um, what can CDC do? I think the first is knowing about these situations and scenarios. I think some of the um, funding lanes are may not be totally under our ownership, but I think we can certainly um, look for our governmental partners and non-governmental partners to um, be aware of these situations and then um, look for ways to um, address down the road. So thanks. That, that's helpful for us to know these who, um, for us who don't work on the front lines um, day to day. So thanks. Appreciate it. I think just as a quick follow-up, the, um, you know, the availability of the COVID vaccines, I think made people think they could just get hepatitis vaccines wherever they would normally get that too. And it wasn't always the same situation when they did that, but it might be the, the right environment to work on that now that patients are willing to, at least some patients are willing to get vaccines. <laughs> so thank you. Dr. Torgerson. Yes, um, uh, Dr. Wang, thank you so much for, for that presentation. I, I uh, want to um, uh, uh, echo some of Dr. Finkel's comments as well as an infectious disease physician practicing in Philadelphia. Uh, we often have hepatitis B uh, vaccine available in our clinic, and really that's, I think, uh, what facilitates um, a vaccination is being able to give it to the patient at its sort of point of care right, right then and there when you identify that they need that hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, but to Dr. Finkel's point, if we're identifying their serologies after they've left the clinic and, and aren't coming back for several months, trying to navigate what pharmacy they can go to, where they can go to addressing copay issues is, is often uh, a barrier. And um, uh, and so those are, are some of the things that I think would be great to um, improve upon. Um, and on our inpatient side, we certainly try and identify uh, Hep B um, or people in need of Hep B vaccine, um, particularly in the setting of our hepatitis screening program to vaccinate them before they leave the hospital and at least get that one-time dose in. Um, so that's at least one additional way that we're capturing people that may not be engaged in, in ambulatory care. Um, uh, lastly, I, I'd pose a question uh, both to Dr. Wang and anybody else on the call. I have no experience with the, um, uh, the uh, three antigen uh, vaccine, and I'm wondering if other people have experience about best practices, any um, challenges in integrating that vaccine into their, their um, program. This is Mark. Um, I'm, I guess the second question. The second question. Um, I know that sometimes the manufacturers have some folks on the call too. I don't know if the VBI folks. But last time I spoke with the VBI about this, um, this was maybe a month or so ago. I don't know that they had actually had vaccine out uh, available for a manufacturer. But I heard this maybe secondhand too. So um, I don't know if any other anyone has other information about that. And for the other issue, Dr. Torgerson, I'm glad you mentioned that the availability has not been an issue um, for vaccine and access. It's kind of, um, uh, I'm personally gonna do more to try to learn more and understand um, about various patient journeys through the healthcare system um, and as they move from point to point in terms of um, how to um, unfragment, if that's a word, uh, their, their experience in terms of with the focus getting a hepatitis B screening and vaccination. So thanks. Thank you. Dr. Rutlin. Good afternoon, Dr. Wang. Thank you. This was very informative, very useful. I can't wait for the recording so I can share it with my colleagues. I think there are three points of um, um, concern for me that I echo over and over again um, for number one, uh, primary care providers labs and patients. Education is always a barrier. Primary care providers need to know cold how to screen for hepatitis B and what that means. You know, I think we've done great things in terms of 
um, simplifying our charts and simplifying um, how to do the tests. It's now a matter of making sure that our colleagues utilize those tools appropriately and know where to find them. So, you know, I, I feel, you know, partly responsible in making sure that those that I work alongside know what to reference and where to go to get those references. Um, that's the first thing. Um, secondly, um, I've noticed, and I don't know if it's just with LabCorp, I will order a, I will order very specifically um, hepatitis C screening, um, hep B, surface antigen, the core, and then the antibodies. And inevitably, when I get the results back, I see um, abnormal um, hepatitis, uh, uh, abnormal hepatitis uh, C. And then when I click on it, I'm like, oh, no, it's not the C. It's that they have maybe the core there or they're just, they're not being detailed with how they're posting that information in the labs. And, you know, it's, if I didn't click in on it to look at it carefully and I didn't know what I was looking at, I think it would you know, be somewhat disconcerting, but I've noticed that they're just not very specific in how they're presenting that information. I'm not sure where to take that, you know, if I should start with our LabCorp representative and bring it to them, or if that's more of a national thing, but I have noticed some um, inconsistencies there. And then finally, you know, just making patients aware that, you know, there's a whole generation of people who have not been vaccinated you know, you know, we're, we're looking at 1982, but quite frankly, I, I think it wasn't widespread that lag of time, again, education probably for primary care providers, where I'm seeing patients who are probably, you know, 25 and up who have not been vaccinated. So anytime I see that, I automatically do a screening um, for all three properties of Hep B and vaccinate accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rutland. And to your point about labs, yes, I think labs are way complicated in terms of like, and, and they could be much simpler. And when somebody screens for Hep B, they should be screening for a panel, but sometimes they're screening for the wrong things. So that's one thing that we're working on at the foundation is streamlining the, inter the results um, and making sure it's a little bit easier to understand and making sure that uh, potentially when surface antigen is ordered, core and antibody are also ordered as well. Um, so making things like that easier, that's something we're working on. But um, I wonder, Dr. Wang, if you have any additional thoughts or feedbacks based on uh, Dr. Rutland's comments. Yeah, I think it's good for me to be aware of these, uh, the commercial uh, laboratory practices and, and the interaction with that. Um, the other thing, pieces that I thought I should mention. I don't know if my colleague, um, Dr. Aaron Connors is on, um, I, not to put you on the spot, Aaron, if, if you're on, but um, if you want to talk about the screening bit, I, I will say that throughout the time of um, the few years that we were developing the uh, vaccination recommendation, some of you guys might know um, Dr. Uh, Brian uh, McMahon up in Alaska, you know, he always stressed, you know, and him and he and others stressed uh, we can't just have the vaccination without the screening piece. Um, and so we know that's a very big piece of it. Dr. Connors is leading that. Um, I think it's in progress, as I said. Um, uh, and at some point we'll have to merge the two, but we don't want to just vaccinate and not, um, and kind of miss the missing millions who, um, who should be screened um, for hepatitis B. So um, Aaron, are you on? Do you want to say a few words about the um, public commenting process? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll just add two thanks to Hep B Foundation for their work and trying to um, make the lab results a little more streamlined. Um, hopefully, too, with the updated screening guidelines that are slated to come out um, by the end of the year, um, that we do emphasize the three test panel. Um, and hopefully that will, you know, a universal adult recommendation with the three test panel may um, kind of push people forward and, and, and just bring attention to it for a wider provider audience. Um, so I'll put in um, a link in the chat. Um, as Mark mentioned right now, the screening guidelines are in draft form and they're available for public comment. And you can see the full um, text of the, of the proposed guidelines right now. So we welcome if you have specific feedback or time to review them, um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. So thanks. Thank you so much. And we'll be sure to share the information for public comment with our listserv after the session and with our notes um, so people can link directly to that from follow up.
Um, and thank you, um, Aaron, uh, for your leadership on that as well. Um, really looking forward to that and, and working together to implement those guidelines. Um, I see a question in the chat. Um, is it best practice to test someone with risk factors, um, for example, foreign born um, intravenous drug user prior to vaccination? Um, I don't know, Dr. Wang or one of our advisory board members, if you guys want to take a stab at that specifically. I was going to defer to Erin if she has um, any comments, but I, I know in the, uh, the in general, it is um, that I think this is talking about pre-vaccination testing, right? Um, so where the um, manage, subsequent management of the patient might um, uh, might hinge on knowing that status. Um, and off the top of my head, I, that some specific routes, think of um, HIV, um, dialysis, um, and, and a few other groups, um, but others um, may want to comment on that too. Yeah, so um, for the new screening recs, there is going to be a move towards the universal adult recommendation. So that would, um, you know, capture, I think, for those who are foreign born or had, um, you know, exposures as a child rather than adults. Um, and then, and while we want to push everybody to get vaccinated for those people who remain unvaccinated um, and are at increased risk, um, that they should continue to receive periodic testing as um, appropriate. So that would include people with injection drug use um, who are in a corrections facility, um, have sexual risk factors, et cetera. Um, and we do have a paper that's in draft right now that's um, being run by some of our partners doing economic analyses. Um, looking specifically at whether it's cost savings to do some screening um, prior to vaccination and whether or not that can save actually save some money with um, reduced doses. So I can also put a, a link to that in the chat. Great, thank you so much. And I see um, we have a colleague comment uh, from VBI directly with an email address. So if anybody has questions about that, um, feel free to reach out and we can also include that within the notes. Any other questions or comments? This is Mark, I just want to say I'm really excited. I think there's a, there's kind of a um, change in the air uh, with these new recs and new recs coming down the pipeline. Um, it's a real team effort here. Um, iterative, pro iterative process with you guys, and um, um, really feel really fortunate to uh, be working on this um, important public health problem um, with all of you here today. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang and Dr. Connors, for your leadership on uh, addressing hepatitis B and really thinking about it from a public health lens. And we're really looking forward to implementing these guidelines and um, continuing to support the efforts towards implementation and elimination. All right, so with that, um, we'll go ahead and move on to our didactic, or no, our case presentation today. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can